Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Leadership Lounge with Marlo Foster. With us today is Bob Luddy. Bob is CEO of Captive Air. Captive Air Systems is the largest privately held manufacturer of commercial kitchen ventilation systems in the U.S. The company, founded by Robert L. Luddy in 1976, is headquartered in Raleigh, North Carolina. Since its inception, the company has expanded from fire suppression to a wide array of products, including exhaust, pollution control, fire suppression and prevention, and utility distribution. Bob Luddy is a man on the move. Not only is he growing his company, Captive Air, but he's also working on issues of education reform in Raleigh, North Carolina. Bob's going to discuss with us today his entrepreneurial spirit and the work he's doing building schools to help educate children in Raleigh. Let's dive into it at the Leadership Lounge with Marlo Foster. So, Bob, I want to thank you for joining us. I have your book in front of me in the studio, Entrepreneurial Life, The Path from Startup uh, to Market Leader. So I thought for our listeners, uh, what I'd like to do is just read a couple of the intro sentences that really talk about Uh, the entrepreneurial spirit and how difficult it is, and then really kick it off with you discussing your entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, So in your intro, you say this, entrepreneurship is not for everyone. It's a long, hard road. It requires a strong sense of where you're going, coupled with the confidence to take major risks without being overly fearful of the outcome. The commitment and energy required alone deters many hopefuls. So we're going to get into captive air and to your education work, but can you just start by talking about your entrepreneurial spirit and where it came from? Yes, uh, my mother was very good about allowing us. I had uh, four brothers uh, and three sisters, and she allowed us to take risks to do things. Sometimes we had to convince her a little bit. Um, She also told us stories about my uncle Bill, who was an entrepreneur dating back to the 40s, and other famous people. And slowly over time, I realized that I wanted to be in business, I wanted to be an entrepreneur, and that was going to be my vocation. Uh, but it was heavily, I would say, influenced by mother and, and also by my father. Mm-hmm. So when you look at uh, your company, Captive Air, so it has grown tremendously over time. Uh, it started uh, mainly focused on fire suppression, as I understand it. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the process, taking that entrepreneurial spirit, starting your own company, and then building it over the long term? Yeah, the early process was pretty tight. Uh, I was notified on a Sunday that the company I was working for was going to cut our commissions by about one third. Mm-hmm. So by Tuesday night, I decided, well, it's maybe not the right time. I don't have the right amount of money. I'm not organized, but I'm going to start this business. (laughs) 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 So, um, and the good thing about that was I knew it would be a very, very formidable challenge, the, the biggest challenge I had in my lifetime. And it would take all the energy and thought and capabilities that I would have to be successful. So on Wednesday morning, I notified him that I was going to depart. Uh, They gave me the option of spending two days or two weeks. I took the two-day option (laughs) and was done on Friday. So Friday afternoon, I went out and bought supplies and got ready to install my first fire suppression system. So essentially, I started out as a committee of one with very little money and as the only installer salesperson in the company. I think one lesson here is that ideas count for more than process or money or other things we hear about related to small business. Over a period of years, uh, we began to install ventilation systems. Uh, Then we made some duct work. So gradually we morphed into a ventilation company over about an eight year period. Mm So eight years later, in 1984, I sold the fire uh, suppression installation company, and we began to focus all of our efforts as a manufacturer of commercial kitchen ventilation systems. 
And again, in, in these times, their startup phase, we were a long way from perfect, but we did some things right. We serviced our customers, mm -hmm. we provided good value, we followed up if there were problems. And that was enough to get us in the game. And by 1985, we had sales of $5 million. So it's very much of a bootstrap operation with grit and determination and looking for every opportunity possible to grow, to make new contacts, to make new friends. And thankfully, over a long period of time, it worked out. Well, well it's interesting. Uh, you, you know, I, I'm actually taking a class right now through the Wharton School, an online class uh, discussing marketing. And they're talking about the new economy um, where everything is very much digital versus the old economy. Uh, where everything was much more hands-on, was much more about people interaction. And to hear you just talk about how you grew your business and, and reading your book, talking about taking your kids to the office uh, on the weekends or taking trips together or how you really um, were in there, you know, as you said, the committee of one, getting your hands dirty. To some extent, that seems to be a, a lost art in the new economy. But the interesting thing about what you're saying is this professor at the Wharton School makes the case that now that the digital economy is so prevalent, people need to go back to the old way of doing things, which is really that face-to-face -face interaction, building those relationships and building those friendships like you're talking about. Yeah, think about it today. There are new obstacles for would-be entrepreneurs, but there's also a lot of uh, capabilities in terms of we didn't have cell phones or internet. Uh, we didn't have modern information technology. So we had to do it the old-fashioned way. But in the modern world, a an individual with some skills has these resources of uh, modern technology to assist uh, in the undertaking of whatever business they want to become involved in. Mm -hmm. I think the key thing to remember is you have to bring value, you have to bring something to the customer of value that makes them interested in you, your product, and your service. Mm -hmm. And being the same as everybody else is probably not going to work very well. <laughs> so <laughs> essentially, if you're the same as everybody else, at best case, you can do as well as everybody else, but keep in mind that if you start a new business, you're not established, nobody knows you, uh, they're not necessarily gonna have a lot of confidence in you. So you have to bring something to the table that moves that customer in your direction. And I think very often there's a study done by uh, Babson College on this issue. And it, it's, it starts with the premise, if you build a better mousetrap, people will make a path to your door comment no way right. <laughs> you've got to sell your product and you have to sell yourself mm. so the idea that i have a world-changing idea or a product may be true mm -hmm. but you're going to have to market and sell it in the marketplace to make it come true that's great uh one of the of the last quotes i want to pull from your book uh, kind of closing the discussion on captive air and then turning to, to education uh, you say one hallmark of successful business owners is that they heed or at least consider good advice from other entrepreneurs. Uh, is there, and in this book, uh, you discuss a, a college professor that you had a ton of respect for. Is there anyone, um, either that specific professor or anyone else in your business past that really gave you um, some very salient advice as you looked at building your company, Captive Air? When I was in uh, high school, I worked in a local drugstore, so I worked for the owner pharmacist for three years doing inventory, waiting on customers, delivering product. So I learned the basis of how a small business operates. And then subsequently in college, I did a similar thing in Philadelphia working at a pharmacy. So I learned the, the rudimentary basics of business. Mm -hmm. um, that was probably the best training ground in the world. I made the comment on TV that I was paid 85 cents an hour at my first pharmacy job. And I was very happy to receive that money because I also knew that this was an opportunity for me to learn and grow. Right. And I think that's an important part when we start talking about minimum wage. At any amount of money that that individual was willing to pay me, I would take the job because it was my first opportunity. Right. And obviously, one opportunity leads to another if you handle them correctly. 
So, all right. So, I, I know the listeners are wondering. So, this guy, Bob Luddy, who starts Captive Air, how do you take that, you know, kitchen ventilation systems, and how does all of that translate into this passion about education uh, and what you've started to do with education and working on education reforms and things like that in North Carolina? How did all this occur? Well, from an early day, uh, I went to Catholic school in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. At that time, coming from a family of eight children, there was no cost to my parents. Hmm. So this was an extraordinary opportunity to get a very decent education um, that, that might have been denied to other people for other reasons. So I realized early on, and of course my father was a huge advocate of e- education, he was a mathematician, how important education is to accessing the American dream. Hmm. Fast forward to North Carolina, Uh, Early on, I realized that some of our employees couldn't read tape measures. Mm. Uh, Some of them didn't know the alphabet. And that that was a little bit shocking to me. And so over a period of time, I wanted to become more engaged in education. And I found out in the public schools, I was really not able to make any significant impact. So in uh, 1998, I opened a public charter school, Franklin Academy. And the school opened up, uh, at that time people didn't know what a charter school was, it was brand new. Some people in the community certainly knew me, but we opened up at capacity day one, hmm. which we'll, we should call a market signal. <laughs> <laughs> people were willing to take a risk um, to get their children educated. Uh, also, the, uh, my dad, dating back to the 50s, always commented that education was too important to be left to the educators. <laughs> <laughs> what he really meant was the bureaucrats. Right. Mm-hmm. So I, I had an understanding that if you give a, teach, a good teacher a fair opportunity in a disciplined classroom, you can probably get some pretty good results. So our whole school approach is based on that good curriculum, strong teacher, respect for the parents, a good environment for the students, you're in the game uh, to produce a very good outcome. Well, well, there's an old saying, you know, if you're uh, acting as an impartial arbiter or as a journalist or whatever capacity, you know, don't act as a fan. But I, I have to say, full disclosure to the listeners, my children, uh, when we lived in North Carolina, both attended Thales Academy. Uh, which is one of the schools that that you are responsible for starting. And I have to say, honestly, that I am an absolute fan. It was an incredible school, uh, an incredible environment. And we have been away from North Carolina for two years now, and they still long for the days of being uh, in the halls of Thales Academy. So can you talk a little bit about the difference between Franklin and Thales and kind of what the impetus was for the expansion to Thales Academy as well? Yes, in uh, about the middle of uh, 2006, it was June, uh, we realized that there was not the availability of any more charter schools because they were capped. So I thought, what about a private school that would be high quality, great outcome, and affordable to middle class people? So I uh, asked some of our employees if they knew uh, individuals who might want to discuss it come by at six o'clock after work. As it turned out, about 30 individuals showed up, far more than I anticipated. Mm -hmm. By 8.30, we were still talking about this idea, and I told the parents, you know, I think you all need to go home now because (laughs) take care of your children, (laughs) and we'll, we'll, we'll convene a meeting at a later date. And that essentially, that meeting launched the Thales Academy with the idea it would be private, it would be the highest quality education we could provide, and it would be affordable. And additionally, we would provide scholarships to children who could not afford to get into the school or could partially afford to get into the school. Uh, so in 07, we opened with 30 students, and the rest is history. Yeah, and and I think uh, you really hit it on the head in terms of, of the affordability aspect. I mean, there is... Um, and I'm trying to tie the whole education landscape together in, in this question. There's so much pressure uh, on the public school system. Uh, and, and I, for one, quite honestly, am a huge advocate for the public school system be, 
because it gives everyone access to an education. I'm also a huge advocate for choice and for you being able to do what you feel is right for your child in terms of them having the opportunity to have the best education. And the blessing of Thales Academy was that it was a tremendous school that was private, that was also affordable. And those three things um, in my study of the education system, especially the affordability aspect, it's tough to find all three of those things put together. How are you managing uh, to keep it affordable and to keep that level of quality that you have in your school? Well, you've read uh, my book on uh, entrepreneurial life, and essentially the same management concepts that made Captive Air a leader are also utilized in, at Thales. Now, educators will, would like to state that uh, education is not a business, but it sure seems like a business that involves money, personnel, right. buildings. <laughs> it absolutely is a business. <laughs> um, so the first thing I did was essentially eliminate any potential bureaucracy. So if you at the first Franklin Academy, we had a lead teacher. We had eight classrooms, eight teachers. One of them was a lead teacher. And we had a couple of special ed teachers. And that was it. And that changes the whole economic model. So we didn't have nurses and cafeterias and curriculum specialists and nursemates or what have you. Uh, so the, the model turned out to be a very good economic model. And keep in mind, as we discussed, the real model is a good teacher with good curriculum in a classroom um, and good environment with those students and cooperation with the parents. That's really what a school is. Right. All the rest of it may have some level of support, but as we know in the public school system, very often the bureaucrats and the support staff interfere with the teacher's ability to execute excellent education. So for those who are uh, perhaps critical of private schools or especially charter schools, you know, talking about the resource issue and taking resources from uh, the truly public school system in any given area. Uh, how, do, how do you manage that? How do you have that discussion in a way that, that can, continues to focus on the child and educational outcomes versus pitting uh, one type of school situation versus another? Well, in North Carolina, the counties provide the buildings and the facilities. So if a charter school opens and they have 500 students, they have to pay for their own building from the allocated state cost. So there's no lack of resources uh, to the school system because the county's gonna provide the money they need to educate the students who are enrolling in their system. Hmm. From the state, it's the same way. The state allocates per pupil. So if 500 students go into a charter not to a public school. The public school doesn't lose any money in the sense that they don't have to educate those 500 students. Mm, okay. And if, if you think about on the margin, those 500 students might require a new building and more staff that the public school doesn't have that expense now. So if you think about competition, in most industries, competition's coming from everywhere. And even though we might say well, it would be great if we didn't have any competitors. It's not really true. It, it's great right. to have competitors. <laughs> because, because human nature being what it is tends to be lazy and want things to be easy. And when you have a competitor, you have to work harder, provide more value. So for the public schools, I would look at charters, private, Christian as a very good thing because they provide new models, they provide competition, they're doing their job of education. And I look at public education differently. We should provide every opportunity to every single student possible and let the parents decide what's the best opportunity because they're responsible for their children, they know them best, hmm. they care the most. And to me, that's the future model. Hmm. So, Bob, I mean, you've had success with Captive Air, you've had success with Franklin and Thales Academies. I mean, what else are you contemplating? What else is on the horizon for Bob Luddy? Well, one thing that we're contemplating now is what we call Thales College. Hmm. 
and I'll give you a frame of reference. I went to LaSalle University in Philadelphia, enrolled in 1963. And the first year cost, I was a commuter, I didn't live there, was $925. The final year cost in 1967 was about $1,100. So my mentality is, the college should cost about 1000 a year, inflation adjusted. Mm-hmm. That's somewhere around $8,000 a year currently. So the idea of Thales College is two things. One, complete college in a shorter period of time by going year round. Mm-hmm. And that can be accomplished in about two and a half years. And if you think it's radical, if you went to Penn State University in engineering in 1943, they turned out uh, civil and chemical engineers in two and a half years. So it's not really a radical idea. So Thales College would have a shorter duration. It would reflect costs, uh, inflation adjusted from the 60s. It would be very intense in that it would use online, personal professor, uh, known as tutoring uh, in the Oxford system. And would also use Socratic, which is a very effective way for individuals to engage as a group to express their understanding and also to learn from other students, but also learn from the professor at the same time. Hmm. So we would deploy all the best techniques we get the student through in a relatively short period of time. And we would use a formatted classical curriculum that teaches them how to think, how to learn, how to read hard passages and understand them, how to write, how to communicate, and and most importantly, to be a good thinking member of our society. Well, Bob, you've had success, as I said, in everything you've done. So I have no doubt that this concept of Thales College will will take root and be a success as well. I would love to have you back to talk a little bit about the progress you've made as it relates to Thales College and anything else you want to share with our listeners. But uh, thank you for joining us today, and we wish you all the best. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be with you today.